All right, in this example, we have a classic work problem. We're being asked, how much work does it take to pull a 200 foot cable that weighs 300 pounds to the top of a building? And in my picture here, I have this worker pulling it by hand, but probably they'd be using some kind of machine, but the amount of work necessary is still the same. Importantly to us, why this is an interesting work question is because as you pull this cable up to the roof, there's less cable below. So importantly, on the very first pull, you have the whole 300 pounds that you're pulling up, but once you're 50 feet through the, through the cable, you have less weight. So every time you pull some, it weighs a bit less, so less force is necessary, and more, less work ends up being necessary to pull the bottom of the rope. So to start the problem, first thing we want to find is this rate of force. The force that we're acting against to do this work is the weight of the cable. So in this case, first, we're going to calculate the rate of force, which is the pounds per feet. So we know the whole cable weighs 300 pounds. It's a 200 foot cable. This gives us three halves pounds per foot. All right, the first thing I'm going to do, I really wanna think about what the intervals are in this case. So what I'm first going to do is take this whole section of this cable, and I'm just gonna split it up into four sections here first. And I really wanna focus on this second interval right here, which is between uh, x sub two, and, or x sub one and x sub two. Let me label all of these real fast. Obviously, the real work I'm going to do is to generalize this, but I think exactly, especially in this example, it really helps to get a concrete idea of how this works. So the concept here is I'm gonna break this rope up into chunks, and then I wanna calculate the work for each of these chunks. There's a couple of interesting things here. So let's focus here on this second interval, as I was saying. So we take this, if I take this full 200 feet right here and split it up into four equal sized chunks, this delta X or the size of these intervals or the chunks I do of this cable, this will be 50 feet. So then given that information right here, what I can calculate is the force on this, on this part right here, which is the 50 feet times the pounds per feet. So it'd be pounds in this case. And so what we get is, we'll call this the force, and the force is, it's this three halves pounds per foot times the 50 feet of that section right there. When we multiply that out, we're going to get 75 pounds. Again, meaning that chunk right there, if we take this 300 pound cable, split it into four chunks, we're gonna have 50 feet in each chunk right here, um, and then 75 pounds per chunk. The thing that's gonna change for each of these intervals is how far I need to raise up that chunk. Again, importantly, if we know the force, I have the force calculated here, it's 75 pounds for this chunk. To figure out the work for this interval, I need to figure out how far I'm going to, it's going to travel. And importantly in this case, I, I've got to choose something. I could choose the, the beginning point, the midpoint, or the end point. Maybe, maybe the middle point in this case would make the most sense, but I'm thinking I want to overestimate how much work this is going to take. And so I'm actually going to use the end point right here. And so this is 50 feet right here, and then this is 100 feet. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use this as my sample point for the travel of this entire section. That's the awkward part here, right? When my sections are really big, the question becomes, well, how far does it travel? But importantly, well, each of these parts are actually not traveling that far, but I got to choose a representative point. I'm going to choose the end point here, the right end point. If you're thinking about it in those terms, I'm going to move this whole chunk 100 feet. Again, this will be an overestimation for this over this interval. So again, I have my force calculated. I know it's 75 pounds, but I'm gonna leave it written like this because this will help us generalize. And then we have our distance in this case is 100 feet. Then finishing for this interval, if I multiply this all together, I already know this is 75. 75 times 100 is 7,500 or 7,500. And just like a fun, important check for the units here. Um, when I look at the units, I got pounds per feet times feet. So that actually, when these two multiply, I get out pounds. We don't know that's 75 pounds. But then I take that 75 pounds and I'm multiplying by 100 feet, giving us units of foot pounds, which we would expect because that is a unit of work. 
As always, I always highly recommend that you take this simple example, think about the construction for these intervals. I think it's really easy to get something really concrete like this, like just actually use four intervals, calculate it from one of them to get an idea, to play around with it. Then we can generalize. So now I'm thinking not just about four intervals and looking at this, uh, this second interval right here. I'm going to think of n intervals. And so if I have n subintervals, and we're going to label this sample point on this subinterval x i star. Again, importantly, once we do this, we're thinking now, what is the size of these intervals? It will be delta x. So if we run through this with exactly this same formula right here, but now generalized, where our for a rate of force does not change, we're going to have this three halves pounds per foot, no matter what. Then we multiply it by this. This 50 feet right here, remember, was the size of that interval originally. So we're taking how much pounds per feet times the number of feet of that interval that we're gonna pull up. Um, in this case, we now are using delta x. So it's the size of this interval for however many subintervals we've created. Then we need to figure out how far we need to pull up this interval or this section right here. Well, we're choosing this representative point here on the interval. So the distance we choose will simply be that xi star value. So that our values that we're doing, actually, this is a really important point. I'm considering zero to be the top and I'm considering 200 to be the bottom of this. So that's really important. You actually could flip this around and many explanations will do that. But for my case right here, what I'm considering is whatever my xi star is, that is giving me the distance to the top right here. So the distance that this interval needs to travel is simply xi star. So we've generalized the work for all of these subintervals, and as we're always going to do, we're going to sum these up, and I'll write this all out. We're going to sum them all up from one to n, however many we have here. I'll rewrite this as three halves xi star and times delta x, the size of the intervals. But as always, the real fun that we're going to do is then let the limit as n goes to infinity of this summation. This is a Riemann sum. So in this case right here, to calculate all of the work done to move this cable up to the top of the building will be the definite integral, in this case from zero to 200, of three halves x dx. And before I move forward and actually evaluate this, because the actual work of evaluating this is going to be very simple, I want to again just talk about this. The logic that you use in the attack is really important in this section. So what I've done is I've generalized for an interval. What I'm thinking is, is what does it take to take this interval up? I know it's just going to be an estimate. The most important part of that, if you see this first example, the ambiguity is in the distance traveled. This is actually, this chunk, this 50 foot chunk I was looking at is exactly 75 pounds. But the question when it comes to work is how far does that chunk need to travel? That's where it gets a bit awkward. Where I'm like, well, is it traveled 50 feet, the top of that interval, or 100 feet, the bottom, or is it 75 feet, somewhere in the middle? The beauty is, is as I create more and more and more and more and more and more sub intervals, that distance is less ambiguous, right? Because as the size of those intervals goes to zero, the, the beginning and the end of the interval is almost exactly the same, and so we'll just take that and move it up. Again, more specifically to say is that as that interval gets smaller, that sample point inside is almost exactly the same as the beginning of the interval or the end of the interval. So I don't need to delineate between the two. I have my force function, which is the rate of force, in this case, three halves pounds per foot, times the number of feet of this interval, times the distance it's going to travel. And I said this integral work is pretty straightforward. I'm just gonna move out that constant right here and now integrate, I have three halves. This becomes one half x squared. I'm evaluating this from 200 or from zero to 200. The zero doesn't do anything. I'll plug in the 200 here and calculate this. 200 squared is 40,000. 40,000 times a half is 20,000. And then uh, 20,000 times three halves divided by two is 10 times three is 30,000. And in this case, again, my units, when I calculated that with that representative interval is foot pounds. Well, 
which tells me the exact amount of work that is required to lift this cable to the top of the building. All right, in this example here, what we have is a 10 meter chain that has a mass of 80 kilograms, it's on the ground, and we're being asked if we picked up one end of this and lifted it up six meters, how much work would that entail? All right, in this case, to find the rate of force, the first thing we need to do is look at the density of this object to figure out how many kilograms per meter. That's pretty straightforward, so we're just gonna take the 80 kilograms of this entire chain, divide it by the number of meters to get that this is eight kilograms per meter. And then importantly, we know that kilograms is not a force, it's just this mass unit, unlike pounds, right? Again, it's an important thing between pounds and, and kilograms. For pounds, that takes into account the effect of gravity, so it is a force. Kilograms is a mass and doesn't. So we have this right here. What we need to do to get the rate of force we need to multiply this kilograms per meter times the effect due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. A really important question here that some students ask is, wait a second, is the effect due to gravity negative? Well, that's really important, but that's always, it's about the perspective that you have. So when we have projectile motion problems, we think about positive heights as going up as our height increasing, and then a negative rate of change as our height going down. In this case, we're just looking at the strength or force of something. You might, for different applications, when you're thinking about work and force, you might think about negative and positive, but in this case, we're just thinking of how hard is it? What is the force? How much work is that? In that case, we're considering this a positive force. But when we multiply these two together right here, what we'll get is this rate of force is 78.4, and then for our units here, our meters are, yeah, the meters cancel, and we get kilograms per second squared. And just to remind you, this might feel very strange as a unit, but this is the units of newtons per meter, which is what we need, it's the rate of force in the metric system. All right, so I've got my rate of force. Now what I'm going to do, as always, I'm going to think about this. I'm gonna separate these into intervals. One thing to say here real fast is that this is a 10 meter chain, but I'm not lifting the last four meters up, so I'm not even gonna consider those as far as the work. In fact, those play no role, especially since this is laying on the ground. This would be different if I was pulling this to the top of the building and only like halfway up. I still would consider the weight of that full chunk, but really important here is that no point are those four meters that are on the ground gonna have an effect. Now, if we want to consider friction in things, like if this rope or this chain was going to move as we're pulling it, there's a lot more complicated we can do that. What we're going to do is we're going to consider us walking with the chain as we pull it up, so there's not as many other variables to consider. So as far as I'm defining the interval on this chain, zero is where we're gonna grab and start picking up, and six is the end. The first thing I want to think about are these, these the size of these sub-intervals as I get n of them. So if I have a representative point right here, so let's call, let's say this is the ith interval, we have x i star right here. The size of that interval, importantly, is in terms of meters, and that's gonna be the size. So the meters in that case for that little chunk is exactly like the, the previous example with the cable. I'm gonna multiply the size of this ith interval times this rate right here. And for me, as always, I just like to check this. As I said a second ago, this is in terms of newtons per meter. Here, this distance right here is the length of this interval right here. This is in terms of meters. So this will be a force function and output newtons. Then comes the question of how far I lift this interval right here. So if you think about this, and I like thinking about this for the very beginning. At the beginning here, this first top, this will be the top when I lift it up right here. So at zero, as far as I have defined it, zero will go up to six. And then for however far I go in, so let me just kind of write this right here. So when I lift this up, let's, let's have it look like this. So this is uh, at the end, it will look like this. This is the position of that zero spot right there. So if I'm thinking, my question I'm thinking is, is where does this point go? So this xi star, let's just cut this up a bunch and just say xi star is right here when I end up lifting it. The question is, is how far does it get lifted? And that answer is, well, I'm lifting this part to six feet. So any part that's, that's 
x units in or x meters in, I can subtract from that six right there. So this distance that I, I lift this part up right there is the six minus x i star. And I can always double check that if I want. Like as I get to six right here, obviously this interval right here, right before six is almost gonna be lifted nothing. So when I've lifted 5.9 feet, I'm just gonna lift this last little piece, a 10th of a foot, and that makes sense, right? Six minus 5.9 would give me the distance traveled by these little pieces to be small. As I go to zero here in the beginning, those are gonna have further distances. Therefore, altogether, the work is the force times the distance. And for the distance, I have six minus this xi star. And again, the xi star, which you're really probably used to at this point, it just represents any point on the ith interval when I have n sub intervals. And then now I'm gonna skip the step where I write this as a summation of all these little works of all these intervals and then take the limit as n goes to infinity. What I think is when you're attacking these work problems, think about it in this case right here. Think about splitting up whatever you're working with in these little intervals, develop a force function and a distance traveled. Then you have defined the work on that little interval. And of course, then for the work of the whole project, we're going to, we're gonna take all those little works and add them up. And so what I'll get in this case is the work to lift this chain from the ground up to a height of one end of this to a height of six feet will be the integral. Now, importantly, from zero to six in this case, not to 10, because again, there's no work being done on this last four meters, is this right here. So 78.4 times six minus x dx. And again, the hard part is really done. Uh, this is not difficult to integrate. In this case right here, I'm gonna pull out this 78.4, integrate this part right here to get six x minus one half x squared. And we're evaluating this from zero to six. And then again, plugging in zero isn't gonna do much here. The only interesting thing is when I plugged in a six, when I calculated this, I got 1,411.2. And then for units, let's just look back at this. And I added in now the fact that I have this distance of M. As we discussed a second ago, the force here is in Newtons because the meters cancel. So it's Newton meters, which in the other words is joules. And I'll just write this as joules. So 1,411.2 joules or four, or 1,411.2 Newton meters is the amount of work needed to lift this off the ground. So these last two examples are really foundational to knowing how to apply the concept of work using the definite integral. And I wanna make, uh, make something very clear, and just for you as you're trying to get to this, one thing that you can do, we're superimposing an interval. So this is not actually on an x, y axis, right? We can manipulate this to use integration in different ways. For some people, I found that it makes a lot more sense if they switch the interval around and think of this as six and this is zero. And actually both of these cases, we've done the same. So for the cable example, I said zero was the top and 200 was the bottom. So then X was the distance we traveled. You absolutely could switch that up and you'd get exactly the same answer. So whatever, what I would just say is that if this you're like, oh, it's kind of blowing my mind, the six minus this XI star, how that works, maybe consider for yourself flipping these around and rethinking this, you might get a different looking integral, but you'll get the same answer out if you apply it correctly.